let's see, the Baptists are outnumbering the uh, Presbyterians tonight. So, how you feeling, RC? Feeling all right? Just working. If there are more Baptists than Presbyterians, that's good because that makes it more of a fair fight. Well, let's just get rolling, okay? The first question comes from Rachel, who's 13 years old, and she asks, if God can do anything, why can't he lie? Now, we're not gonna everybody, you know, chime in on each question, but is there anyone who would like to answer this for Rachel? Don't be embarrassed, don't be shy. If you don't, I will. I'm not going to waste time. This is an easy one. This is a slow pitch oh, at, right down the middle. At, at, this, is, this is an easy one, and he looks at me. Uh, it's very comforting. The, uh, there are lots of things that God can't do. God can't do anything that is contrary to his nature. His will is bound to his nature. So uh, God cannot lie because he cannot do anything that is evil. God is pure perfection. And uh, for God to, to even be capable of lying would mean that he would be capable of imperfection. Very good. And the, the, the premise that is mistaken here is the first premise, if God can do anything. But the Bible doesn't say that God can do anything. When we say that he's omnipotent, that means he always has total power over his creation. But there are things he can't do. He can't lie. He can't die. He can't be God and not be God at the same time. So, I mean, we can't think that omnipotence means that he can do anything. But thank you, Rachel, for that insightful question. Now, this one I'm going to ask Steve to answer because he's the only one up here who will know the references. How do, we, how do you reconcile verses such as John 3.16? Are you familiar with that one? Am I going too fast? <laughs> with Psalm 5, 5 to 6. Stop right there. Do you know what Psalm 5, 5 to 6 says? Sure. That sure. The, that the Lord hates I called the, the right guy. And what? Indignation with them every day. Um, well, I think the key, first of all, is you've got to go to Romans 9, what is it, 13, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Uh, there is a distinction uh, in God's heart as it relates to redemption. Um, towards his elect and towards his non-elect. So I would take Psalm 5 to be God's righteous uh, indignation towards those who are in sin, and even the elect before they're regenerated are in sin and under the wrath of God, Romans 1 verse 18. And so they are in a state of uh, being under divine vengeance. Um, before they come experientially into Christ by the new birth. Um, John 3.16, uh, I think that speaks of not every individual in the world is the object of God's redeeming love, but uh, speaks of the sphere of mankind that uh, as the scope of it, not particularly, but just in general, the scope of the world. Uh, all those who believe are those who show themselves to be the object of God's eternal redeeming love. Okay. Would you suggest approaching or discussing controversial issues of faith, for example, predestination and God's election, with a, quote, Christian family member who avoids such issues? If so, if you do approach these discussions, how do you do it? Alistair? <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Um, is it, the person wants to have the discussion, the, the, or, or the, the individual feels the person needs to have the discussion? I think that says, so would you approach a person in the family who don't, doesn't want to discuss issues like that? Would you still? No. You wouldn't approach it? Not necessarily. I, I like to. Um, I mean, it depends what the motivation is. <clears throat> if the motivation is because the person is lacking in assurance or doesn't have an understanding of God's 
sovereign overruling over things in their life, and that's your motivation, that's one thing. If it is that you've just been reading a bunch of books about predestination and you want to you know, fill somebody's head with that, it may not be necessarily the right time or the right way to go at it. And um, so the context would really determine it, I think. Al, do you have anything to say about I think there's a lot of pastoral wisdom in what Alistair just said, and, and frankly, a lot of kind of evangelistic wisdom there as well, because uh, the first thing that strikes my mind is the picture of someone sitting down at Thanksgiving dinner and the weird uncle wanting to talk about predestination. Uh, <laughs> you know, th 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 there are ways to make doctrines more and less winsome, and that, that I think is probably not the best way to help win persons to a deeper understanding of the gospel. But I, I think that there are moments in which you can, you, can help, you can help persons to understand what you believe more clearly. That's a good humble way to be involved in a conversation with someone. I want to make sure you, you do understand what I believe and you're not misunderstand. You know, we hold what the Scripture teaches and what we come to know about the gospel passionately. It's going to come out of us. It, it must come out of us. But it needs to come out of us winsomely, especially with those uh, such as family members that uh, we have a relationship with, we pray for a long time. Uh, don't think you need to win this argument over the Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, establish relational credibility along with the biblical and theological credibility to say, at the appropriate time, let's talk about this. All right, thanks. Here's one. Does human responsibility <clears throat> eliminate irresistible grace? Who would like that one? Well, let me just say that let's admit that irresistible grace is not the way we would choose to express this. Effectual calling is a far more biblical way to, to, to express this because irresistible grace sounds like a cartoon setup in which there's someone saying, I do not want to be regenerated, I do not want to be born again, I do not want to love Christ, and yet they're being overruled such that against their will. I mean, what kind of love is, is capable of being constructed out of being overruled? Uh, with one's will. No, it's effectual calling that reminds us that what God begins in terms of the order of salvation, He always finishes. And, and when that work of genuine faith begins in, in the believer, the work of God, uh, He will bring it to full fruition. You're going to see it when grace becomes, the operations of grace becomes evident in the, in the individual because they do love Christ and they do desire the things of Christ. They, they desire salvation. And, and so we just need to get rid of the straw man. There are two horrific, cartoonish straw men we need to be rid of. The first is the righteous sinner who desires to be saved but just can't because he's, when I say righteous and desiring salvation, because he's, 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 not, he, he's, he's not among the elect. And the other is the, the person who desperately does not want to be among the elect but has been elected anyway. Uh, neither of those persons is found within the Scriptures. The other thing I don't like about the term irresistible grace, although I believe the concept historically, of course, is that it suggests that God's saving grace in election is irresistible. On the contrary, we resist it with all of our heart. What, what, what is meant by irresistible grace is not that it's incapable of being resisted, but rather it is effectual and God's sovereign grace overcomes our sinful resistance. Are you ready to move? Yeah. We're moving. We're trucking. How are you? <laughs> was King Saul regenerate, or was he simply empowered by the Holy Spirit as a tool for God's glory without salvation? I never met him, so I can't answer that. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> I knew King Saul. <laughs> You're no King Saul. <laughs> Mike? Yes. <laughs> I never met him either. We told you to go down that side. We're, we, we, we just realized that we don't have an answer. Steve? I don't know that I've got the last word on that. I, I think… Does anybody have the first word? We, yeah. <laughs> never mind the last word. I can't squeeze one word out of these guys. I, I'm going to go with no. You're going to go with no. <laughs> Why don't you flip a coin while you're at it? Let's take a vote on it. That's fine. What do you think, Al? 
I think it's a question not answered in Scripture and a question nonetheless that does have a context in, in the, the grand narrative of Scripture in which Saul is an antitype to David who is, of course, uh, the, the great king upon whose line uh, the Davidic Messiah is established. I think in terms of covenantal history, Saul is presented as out and David as in and uh, they are presented that way, but at the end of the day, the precise way that question is asked is simply not answered in Scripture, which is true for many of the saints of the Old Testament. When we come to Hebrews chapter 11, uh, there are some who are named, but most in the Old Testament are not named, and we, we will find out in, in due time. I, the problem is, is as, as uh, Dr. Miller says, we don't get a definitive answer in the narrative about <clears throat> Saul's condition. But I think the reason why we struggle with it is because when he is made king, he's anointed by God, and he's anointed by the Holy Spirit. And one of the things we're asking theologically is that anointing of the Spirit simply a charismatic empowering for a particular office to be fulfilled, or does it carry with it the implication of being regenerated by the Holy Spirit? If he was regenerated by the Holy Spirit, then we see an example in the Scripture of somebody who has had a very radical and serious fall away from that regeneration and could be used as an exhibit in the argument against the, of those who say you can lose your salvation. We could excuse his actions by saying he became mentally imbalanced and that he was still in grace, but excusably uh, bizarre in his behavior. Or we could say, as the question suggests, that the anointing or empowering of the Holy Spirit to carry out a particular office does not carry with it the necessary implication that he was regenerated by the Holy Spirit. The Scripture gives plenty of evidence of the radical character of his fall, gives us not very much evidence of any restoration from that, which would mean, lead me to believe that he wasn't regenerate, but I don't think we know for sure. And there's no restoration in Israel's memory. Do we need to be concerned or study deeply the differences between beliefs of the church and Israel and beliefs about believers' baptism versus infant baptism? Do we need to be concerned about these things? This takes enough Presbyterian to answer. Or, or, you're not even Presbyterian, are you, Mike? I'm Reformed. We're, of course, we're, we're Presbyterian, Reformed. We're all the same family. Okay. Uh, Yes, I do think that it's important. It, I think it's important mainly because it is grounded in the way we approach the, the Scriptures as a whole. And I think that, that we have often more agreement among Calvinistic, Baptist, and Presbyterian folks on this uh, than, than outside our circles. But uh, I think, for instance, when you come to the, the, the question of baptism, if it is the work of God signifying and sealing His covenant pledge in the covenant of grace, then we come to the Bible looking for continuity, assuming continuity, uh, a continuity of Old and New Testaments, one Abrahamic covenant that the New Testament says is, is fulfilled in Christ. And if we… If we do that, then we're going to see baptism replacing circumcision as the sign and seal of that Abrahamic covenant. If we come to the Scriptures assuming discontinuity between the Old and the New Testaments uh, on various levels, then I think uh, we're, a, a tendency is going to, to be perhaps to say, well, the Old Testament was interested in sacraments, in physical, visible things, and the New Testament uh, is, is not uh, as concerned about that. It's more concerned about individual personal faith in Jesus Christ. And I think that that's not true of the Old Testament or the New. I think we would all agree with that. Uh, 
and that uh, the promise is still God's promise to us and to our children. And it's a, it's a wonderful, I think, uh, not just theological idea, it's a wonderful comfort uh, speaking as, as a presby- on the Presbyterian side, it's a wonderful comfort to know that uh, our children are included in God's precious promises. And so we raise them as those who are rightly entitled and as believers in the Old Covenant raise their children with the expectation that they would profess faith in Christ uh, with the same obligation to do so. So to we have the same exhortations in the New Testament, don't be like that wilderness generation. They heard the gospel too, but didn't combine the hearing of it with faith. Well, we heard some discussion earlier about about being tolerant and intolerant and all of that, and we live in a time of the relativation of truth. And I've always said in this discussion with respect to the debate between infant baptism and believer's baptism is that the first thing we have to understand is that the New Testament nowhere explicitly commands the baptism of infants, nor does it anywhere explicitly forbid the baptism of infants. And so whichever side we come down on has to be dealt with on the basis of implications drawn from the biblical text. And though we differ on this, I think that the judgment of charity requires that when we do have this discussion, that we understand that those who think that babies should be baptized really are convinced that it is the moral duty of the Christian to have their infant children baptized. And on the other side of it, those who don't believe in infant baptism truly believe that it is not the proper way to exercise the sacrament, and that both sides have to respect that the other side really wants to do what is pleasing to God. We just differ with respect to what we think is most pleasing to God. Now, since both of us want to be pleasing to God, and we differ on what is pleasing to God, should we discuss it? Should we debate it? Of course. Without rancor, without division, but with an honest inquiry and discussion, acknowledging, I think, my Baptist friends want to please God, and they don't think infant baptism pleases them, and I think it does, and so we differ on that point. But it is important, because every article of truth is important. It's not the most important thing. Obviously, we differ on that here in this panel, but what we believe that what unites us is far greater than what divides us. That's why we're standing together on these things. Well said. Well said. If I might begin by saying, first of all, uh, inviting a Baptist to speak about baptism succinctly is a dangerous thing. Uh, Asking a Baptist if talking about baptism is important is an insane thing. Uh, But nonetheless, here we are. Um, I I want to stipulate one thing at the beginning. Everyone on this panel believes in believer's baptism. The Roman Catholic Church believes in believer's baptism. Uh, the question is not should new believers be baptized who have never been baptized. Uh, the question is should infants be baptized? And so with that clarification, let me just say that, you know, we got our name the hard way <laughs> by, uh, by taking a stand on this one. And uh, when I talk to my Presbyterian and Reformed brothers and sisters, and by Reformed I mean in those denominations, you know, I always begin by saying we should be thankful of of several things. First of all, we may be the last people on earth who could have an honest disagreement. 
we don't believe in the relativity of truth. We, we believe the Scripture is important. We want to be obedient to the Scripture. So where we differ, we really think that's pretty important, just as R.C. said. And, and so, yes, we need to have this conversation. We don't, we're not having this, com- this conversation as adversaries across, uh, you know, a table where we need a mediator to come in and negotiate. We're having this conversation as persons who desperately desire mutually to be in submission to the Lordship of Christ and in obedience to the Word of God. Baptists believe that those who should be baptized are those who have come to a a personal faith and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and have professed Him as Savior and Lord. This is not a new argument, Uh, nor is it detached from what I would simply say, are, and R.C. used the word implications, are, are implications of the gospel. And I'll just say as a Baptist, it is far easier for me to live with believers' baptism and the baptism of believers only, uh, understanding that there remain questions, because I believe that that is most faithful to not only my understanding of baptism in the New Testament, but to the picture of what baptism represents and to the gospel. And so for that reason, it's something I do have to talk about, but I really like to talk about it among friends. And, uh, and that means uh, with those of you in this room and in the larger conversation where those who believe in the inerrancy of Scripture and in the integrity of the gospel and justification by faith alone can come in the room and have the right kind of conversation with the right spirit. Okay. Now, this, this question is specifically directed to Dr. Horton. Are you familiar with the theophostic prayer, and would you consider it a form of Gnosticism? This is distinct from Theophon the Recluse. From what? Theophon the Recluse. I don't know. Uh, the, I've never <laughs> heard of the theophostic prayer. I don't know what it's talking about. It, it, I, it, is this the Hesiodic prayer? Uh, group of Byzantine monks? I have no idea. Uh, Okay. Wow. Uh, (laughs) Is this from theosophy or not? No. No, no, this is… Gregory of Palamas. I wasn't asked the question. Do you think… Is it talking about Gregory of Palamas and No, I think it's talking about the modern movement that emerged in some evangelical churches where it's known as theophostic prayer. And I I have no idea that. And the answer is yes. Okay. I, I, then you, then you answer it. Thank you, Dr. Horton. <laughs> yeah, I can't answer these questions when I don't know what they mean. <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, good. For anyone. Uh, uh, yes, t- uh, hang on, can this? Oh, go ahead. Do we have any, do, who's, who's into this? Insofar as I can track it, I've had several calls to the radio program and other things about it. It, it, it emerged in some evangelical circles where uh, it's, uh, you know, quite frankly, is I think Gnosticism is about the best word for it, uh, in, in which one is drawing certain inferences, supposedly from the Spirit and the reading of Scripture that are applied in this way. And uh, it, it, it is not a large movement, at least thus far, I think, as verified by the fact that we're not ready to have an extended conversation about it. <laughs> Here's the next question. If there is one Holy Spirit guiding believers, why are there denominations and so many varied interpretations? Can I jump in there? I sure. think. Jump right in there. Uh, you know, why are there so many interpretations of science? Why are there so many interpretations? A, a sign of a living discipline is the amount of debate and discussion and even dissension that it generates. People don't walk around uh, ta- you know, getting all hot and bothered about things that don't matter. And uh, uh, scientists form schools uh, and, and raise their voices at each other over particular interpretations of things that would seem to most of us lay people is pretty arcane. But they're important, uh, uh, and it's a sign of vitality that there's enough there to work on, there's enough there to generate for 2,000 years, still generating controversy. I I think there's a positive (laughs) uh, uh, evidence of uh, fruitfulness there from controversy. At the same time, I think that the, you know, the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth by His Word. 
The Word is not the problem. God has spoken clearly. Our ears are dull. Our hearts are still confused. Our minds uh, are still drawn to uh, all sorts of confusions. And we're finite, besides being sinful. In this, in this age, we're pilgrims. I love one of, you know, one of the, the, the recurring titles of the old 16th and 17th century Protestant systems was a theology for pilgrims on the way. And so, we, we don't see our, our, our theological uh, systems as nailing it down. Not in this life or in the next will we know the truth as God knows it. Not even in heaven will we know anything the way God knows it. But God has revealed in His baby talk kind of way what He desires for us to know for our salvation. And I do think it's significant that for 2,000 years, in spite of all of our disagreement, in spite of all of the controversy, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed have remained core agreements for churches that otherwise don't even recognize themselves as faithful churches. The Bible has to be clear enough to get that out of it, and uh, that is a pretty remarkable clarity. Well, we have to realize that the, the Bible is infallible. The Holy Spirit is infallible as He illuminates the text of Scripture to us and as He assists us in our understanding. Today we looked at ten principles or rules of biblical interpretation. But remember that those who apply the rules of biblical interpretation and who benefit from the illumination of the Holy Spirit and have the presence of an infallible Bible in front of us are still fallible, fallen creatures. And we still have all kinds of ways in which we come to the text of Scripture and miss what it is saying. One of those is bias, love lines. You know, my grandfather believed this, my father believed this, and I'm not going to change my mind because if I do, I'm going to have to admit the familial error that's gone for at least three generations. Is that about infant baptism you're talking? Or? <laughs> so you could apply it yeah. to that. I mean, we do have those love lines. There's no question about those love lines will often cause us to be biased with respect to certain elements. We have the problem of what we call eisegesis, reading into the text things that aren't in the text. I, gave a, I was invited to give a convocation address at a major evangelical seminary several years ago in which you usually give an academic uh, lecture of sorts, and I lectured on the necessity of having a, an introductory course of logic as a required course in the seminary curriculum. I was about stoned after that. And the reason I said it is that when we're so zealous to understand the Scripture that we go back and learn the languages, Hebrew and Greek, we learn the zitz and lab and the life situation in which this text was given, the original historical context and all of that. And yet the number one reason for misinterpreting the Bible is drawing inferences from texts that are illegitimate inferences. And just learning the basic rules of immediate inference from a basic course in logic will help correct our errors in interpretation. But as long as we come to that text with bias, with muddle-headedness, with a lack of, of discreet uh, intellectual inquiry, we are vulnerable to misinterpreting it and building entire denominations upon it. So it's not really surprising that we have this. Now here's the next question, and I have, I have to think it's addressed to me. If God has ordained evil, because I said He has, how is He not the author of evil? Hmm, legitimate question. Uh, what I didn't say <clears throat> this morning was that what we call the supreme biblical a priori, that is the single most important stipulation when we come to do theology from the Bible, is that God is not the author of evil. But yet I said that God in ordains evil, but I said, quoting Augustine, He ordains it in a certain sense. 
not in yeah. the sense that he coerces the creature yes. to do evil. If he did that, then he would be the author of evil. This may be a weak analogy, but I've written a lot of books in my lifetime, and I'm responsible 100 percent for what I say in those books that I author. I carry a certain culpability for what I say. Now, when I write a book, I don't publish the book. The publisher enters into an agreement with me and asks me to write a book on a certain subject, and that publisher doesn't always agree with what I write or what I say. But the certain says, humanly speaking, the publisher has ordained that this task be carried out without themselves being immediately culpable for what I do or say. When I say, remember this, that if God is sovereign, what a stupid thing to say. Since God is sovereign, I mean, if he's not sovereign, he's not God, and we don't have to have this discussion at all. That anything that happens in this world, in a certain sense, has to be ordained from God or it couldn't happen. Because God knows what I'm going to do before I do it, and he has both the power and the authority to prevent it. He knows what I'm going to do. Before I do it, he can vaporize me. If he doesn't vaporize me, if he removes the restraints and allows me, not in the sense of sanctioning it, but he lets me do it, does that make him evil? Of course not. He allows us to commit sin where he could have stopped it. Now, if God allows it to happen, for him to allow it to happen, he has to choose to allow it to happen. And if he choose to allow it to happen, then obviously his will is that it should happen rather than it should not happen, or it couldn't happen. And that is not only respect to the fall, but that's with respect to whether I make a six-foot putt or don't make a six-foot putt. I plead with him for help on those occasions. <laughs> but does, does that make sense? We say that he's ordaining it in a certain sense, but that doesn't make him the doer of it or the author of it. You guys want to say anything about that? You know, I just think of B.B. Uh, B. Warfield's little book, The Plan of Salvation. Mm -hmm. It's such a succinct statement. And in one page, he says, in the end, the creator must take responsibility for his creation. But that is with respect to its ends. And he defines what those ends are, and he defines his own character as he, he sovereignly uh, sees this through to the end. And as Warfield says, in the end, we will not have the question. Exactly. R.C. Sproul Jr. stated that the bigger question is that Christians don't care about the fact that they are sinning. What is the answer to that question? Why don't Christians care that they are sinning? And obviously implied in this, why don't they care enough? Alistair. Well, the, because we don't truly understand the nature of the atonement and what has happened in Christ bearing our sins and um, taking upon himself um, all the heinous nature of, of who and what we are. I think that <clears throat> a low view of the atonement it goes directly in line with an easy-going view of, of sin. And in the same way that when people take sin seriously, uh, they usually have a pretty solid and clear grasp of what has happened uh, in Christ dying for us. Um, you know, I suppose we should be encouraged to recognize that <clears throat> this wasn't a moot question for, for Paul when he was penning Romans. Uh, otherwise, he wouldn't have launched into chapter 6 after chapter 5, because the same question was present for him then. He anticipated it, uh, the doctrine of justification by faith being misunderstood and misapplied could so readily lead to the approach that he uh, counteracts there in Romans chapter 6. And I think, 
I, I think the answer actually lies in the gospel, you know, that, that an understanding of what, what has happened in the gospel, that if we don't preach the gospel to ourselves all day, every day, then we will be the, the, the we, we, we will fail in some arena. And one of, the, one of the areas of failure is a fast slide into antinomianism. And uh, so people then, uh, under the disguise of a superabundant uh, concept of the grace of God, uh, answer the question with which Romans 6 begins and answer it wrongly. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Answer, yes. And so off they go. And uh, so they answer that question wrongly. And, uh, and, that, and I think that's part of it, at least. I also, I think, uh, in terms of the social context of uh, contemporary evangelicalism, uh, the sort of downgrade in relation to just about everything, standards, uh, general perspective on morality, language, um, respect for elders, uh, fastidiousness in relationship to punctuality, the, the keeping short accounts in, in questions of did it happen at three in the afternoon or did it happen at three in the morning or does it really matter, uh, teaching your children these things. These things are all constituent elements in taking seriously letting your yes be yes and your no be no. And in one sense, I think ultimately that question of honesty or dishonesty before God is directly tied again to looking away to who Christ is and what Christ has done. You know, shall I take my body and join it to a prostitute? What kind of question is that? That's a question for a Christian because the Christian has been united with Christ. The Christian is in union with Christ. And it is because of our, I, I, that, now I've got the answer to my own question. I'm finally getting the answer. It, the, the reason is that the believer does not understand the notion of union with Christ. And when we don't understand what it means to be united with Christ, then all we'll be left with is either legalism on the one hand or, or a lawlessness on the other hand. It is since then you have been raised with Christ. You seek those things that are above. And it is because of who you are in Christ, because your nature has been changed, because your status has been changed, because you've been raised with heaven to the heavenly places, that these things are not impossible, but they are now incongruent. And I think part of the problem is that people do not know who they are in Christ. I think this is the second best chapter. I, I think also that there's there's a hidden premise in the question that can be very distorting. When we ask the question, why do Christians, the real question is why don't Christians care about their continuing sin? It is absolutely impossible for a person to be regenerate of the Holy, by the Holy Spirit and not and not care at all about sin. In that sense, there's no such thing as the, quote, carnal Christian who can receive Christ and be regenerate and have no repentance. That's impossible. That is as unbiblical as it gets, okay? I think what's implied in the question is why don't we care to the degree we ought to care? We care, but we don't care enough. And it's because our hearts are still less than fully sanctified. And God the Holy Spirit in His convicting power has not fully revealed to us the sinfulness of our sin. Thank God. Exhibit A is David after his ghastly act of adultery and proxy murder of Uriah was trying to cover it up. Was it ease in Zion? He was a believing man, and he's down in the dregs of evil, and yet he doesn't really show a whole lot of concern until God sends that prophet to him and tells him the story. And when the light dawns, when Nathan says, Thou art the man, whoo! Wow! David sees the evil of his sin and writes Psalm 51. 
Psalm 51 could never have been written by a human being who didn't care about his sin or an unregenerate man, as that, as far as that goes. But here's the blessing. If God revealed to me right now the full measure of the continuing sin in my life, it would destroy me. God is gracious and gentle in correcting us gradually. That's one of the things that's nice about progressive sanctification. Because if we gave it all at one time, we'd be dead. Yeah, I would just add to that. I think some Christians are not as sensitive to their sin for a couple of reasons. I think on one side of the spectrum, there is a lack of exposure to the light of God's Word. And it is the Word of God that shines the holiness of God, that light into our hearts. And when we are distant from the Word of God, um, I think there are hidden sins in the heart that are not being brought out into the light to be exposed. And so I fear for Christians who are not in a Bible teaching church um, and having regular constant exposure to the pure light of revelation that brings out into the open my sin. And I think that's why some people just stay home and watch on television or whatever, because it's a safe way uh, to live the Christian life without having to come face to face with the light of God's holiness. I think on the total other end of the spectrum, there are people who have much exposure to the Word of God, but it's just intellectualism. Um, it's just a mind game for them. And it never really stirs the heart and the affections, as Edwards would say, are, are never really touched. And so it's just all cognitive uh, in the head, but it never affects the heart. I, I also think that people digress into such a state, one, when they're not under red-hot preaching of the Word of God. Um, I think that you can have exposure, again, in an intellectual way to the truth without there being the conviction of the Holy Spirit that comes through penetrating, heart-searching, sin-exposing preaching. Um, also, I would add that if one is not regularly coming to the Lord's table, uh, the Lord's table is very discriminating. And as you just spoke of the atonement, um, or I guess that was Alistair speaking of the atonement, I mean, there needs to be on a regular basis, you're coming face to face with the substitutionary, sin-bearing, wrath-absorbing, freely justifying death of Christ upon the cross for us, and confessing my sin to God as I come to the Lord's table. I mean, this isn't just a, a routine or a ritual I'm going through. It, it, is a, it is a spring cleaning session in my heart as I come to the Lord's table and humbling myself under the mighty hand of God and asking Him to bring out into the light uh, those sins that I have not yet confessed and acknowledged to the Lord. I have not yet repented of these sins. And I have not yet truly become broken in some degree over my sin. I mean, Jesus did say, blessed are um, those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And so I, I think it's important to be preaching the Beatitudes. And not only blessed are the poor in spirit, but blessed are those who mourn. And that is a mourning over my own sin and the hard-heartedness and the thick-headedness and uh, of my own sin, and I think there are things that contribute to that as well, such as being out of fellowship with other Christians who are contagious in their love for the Lord, in their excitement for the Lord, in their pursuit of holiness. And if I am not uh, being interwoven into a local body of believers who are pursuing holiness, Hebrews 12, 14, 
then it, it, the Puritans used to say, Satan will always attack the ship that does not sail in convoy. And so when we're just a lone ranger Christian out there without other brothers and other sisters and elders and pastors around me and nurturing my heart, then, then there is, that is going to contribute to my, to my own heart growing as Ephesians 2, 4 says, but I have this against you. You have left your first love. And so I, I just think the key is the Word of God, the Lord's Supper, other contagious Christians who are dynamic in their faith, their pursuit of holiness, um, as well as my own personal reading of the Word of God and, and prayer and even just taking like the Psalms, for example, and just praying those verse by verse back to the Lord, uh, prayers of repentance that are in the Scripture themselves. Uh, without these ordinary means of grace, then I am susceptible to seasons or times in which I don't care as much as I really ought to care. But I totally agree with you, R.C., if you are regenerated by the Spirit of God, and then you are a new person in Christ, and the old things are passed away, and behold, new things have come, and you will have a heart that is sensitive to the things of God, and to some degree, you hate sin, and you hate it in your own life. Thank you, Steve. How can I, how can I, parentheses, a Baptist, reconcile the sola fide message, that is justification by faith alone message, of the Reformers with their seemingly inconsistent doctrines on baptism and regeneration. I think what's behind this question is if justification is by faith alone, why is it that you have the Lutherans believing in baptismal regeneration, and why do you have the Reformers, Calvin and Zwingli and Knox, practicing infant baptism, where the sign is given to people who are not even capable of having faith? You want to try to answer that, Mike? Let's see. Uh, well, it, it, in, the, in the Reformation, you had uh, a spectrum of views, Zwingli on one side of the Reformers, saying that uh, heavenly things are not given through earthly things. And Luther on the other side of the, reformer, the spectrum of the Reformers saying, no, the, 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 the incarnation is an example of the fact that God becomes flesh, and God works with, with material things. But uh, in, in that emphasis, Luther and Lutheranism preserved a, a sort of medieval idea of an infusion of habits that transforms one at least to give them a disposition to believe. Now, Lutherans believe that you have to believe in Christ to be justified, but that that disposition to believe regeneration occurs uh, in baptism. And uh, Calvin and our Reformed Confessions hold that the sign is united to the reality that it signifies over against Zwingli, but that it cannot be absorbed into the reality signified. So in the Old Testament, you've, you constantly have uh, a distinction between, uh, well, especially the way the New Testament interprets the Old Testament, being circumcised in heart and merely being outwardly circumcised. The same would be true of baptism uh, or the Lord's Supper. And Lutherans are very reticent to talk about that inward and outward distinction because they smell Zwingli. We're not saying what Zwingli said. We're not separating the sign from the reality signified. Uh, now, in their defense, Lutherans do not uh, uh, believe that this regeneration is a work that we perform. Uh, quite the contrary, it is something that God does. Even Roman Catholics do not believe that baptismal uh, uh, 
that the, that the grace supposedly infused in baptism is the work of the, the infant, that's all of grace. So that's, that's not the, uh, the bone of contention. The, the real issue is whether the sign is always accompanied by the reality signified or whether, in the words of the Westminster Confession, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the grace, the, the thing real, uh, uh, the reality signified uh, is not necessarily attached to the moment of its administration. That's, that's Calvin's position that the uh, experience of the benefits signified by baptism may occur before the baptism, as would be the case of an adult who's baptized after he comes to faith and receives all of the benefits of his justification that's signified by his baptism. And in the case of an infant, he has the sign before he has the faith, just that's one of the parallels with circumcision in the Old Testament, which included, among other things, a sign of faith and the, and the benefits of salvation. Abraham, of course, has faith then receives the sign. Isaac receives the sign, then he has faith. And so Calvin emphasized that point that there is no temporal connection necessarily between the sign and the benefits that it signifies. So therefore, I mean, what, what Calvin would, would teach and the Reformers, or particularly Calvinism, that justification is by faith and by faith alone. It's not by baptism. It's not by the Lord's Supper. These things are important signs and seals of the promises of God, but those promises are only realized by faith. So in their theology, at least in Calvinistic theology, there's no inconsistency. Yeah, the, and the big difference between Zwingli and Calvin on this point, where he did side with Luther, is in saying that these are not signs and seals of our decision and works. These are signs and seals and pledges of God's decision and work. And that's, that's where Calvin did believe, yes, God works through physical means, but he is, he is not bound to them. The Holy Spirit works when and where He wills, even though He has, by His Word, pledged to work through earthly means. According to Romans 9, 14 to 18, God is not unjust in electing some on whom to have mercy and some to harden. Some would say that though God is not unjust, he nevertheless appears to show favoritism, which seems to be contrary to Scripture. Passages like Romans 2.11 that state that, that God does not show favoritism. You take that one out. Well, let's think about the big picture of Scripture before we go to any particular text. Does God relate to all human beings in exactly the same way? And the answer is profoundly no. And in fact, no sane or intelligent person before ever getting to this question can imply that God is disposed towards all persons equally, gives unto everyone the same material blessings, the same parents, uh, the, the, the same cultural context. Even before you get to salvation, is God obligated to treat all human beings in all places at all times in exactly the same way? Well, let's look at the Old Testament. Is God obligated to treat all nations? Uh, all peoples, all tribes in exactly the same way? We, we don't seem to ask that question. We, 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 don't, we don't usually focus on that. We wait until we get to Romans chapter 9. But God relates, before we ever get to the question of, of His eternal predestination, God relates to human beings, to different tribes, to different peoples, to different individuals in different ways. It comes down to whether we actually believe that God accurately and truthfully reveals Himself as sovereign, omnipotent, holy, righteous, and perfect, infinite in all of His perfections. If so, and this is His Word, the inerrant and infallible Word of God, He tells us right up front that He does not relate to all persons in exactly the same way. He does not relate to, uh, to Ishmael the same way he relates to, to Isaac. He, he, he does not relate to uh, the, uh, the Amalekites the same way he relates uh, to the children of Israel. When we come to, to our salvation, and, and we know to say this, and, and so we, when we're evangelicals and get together, we, we remind ourselves to say this, we just do not hear ourselves say this. No one is worthy of salvation. 
God is obligated to save no one. He, for reasons that are hidden in the counsel of his own will, before the creation of the cosmos, determined to save a people through the blood of his son. And that was not an undefined, unspecified people. Israel was not an undefined, unspecified people, nor is the redeemed people of God. We are left with many questions we cannot answer, but we're ab absolutely obligated to every single word of Scripture. And to treat God as if He must be accountable to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission <laughs> is to fundamentally misunderstand what it means for God to be God. Uh, the reality is that God is not fair. I, I speak about this so often. The fairness doctrine is a, is a lousy doctrine that works for three-year-olds in a sandbox because about the most you can expect of, of little kids in a sandbox is that you can encourage them to be fair. That's why when you have two kids and one piece of pie, mom says one will cut and the other will choose. Okay, after Genesis 3, we're stuck with that. God is not fair in that sense. He is perfect. Perfect is not accountable to fair. And God's purpose to save is not accountable to our moral questions. We understand why these questions arise, but what makes Christians Christian is that we understand that those questions are answered in Christ, who, for instance, in the Gospel of John, makes very, very clear that there's a distinction between the elect and the world. And to the glory of God, it is what it is. But that does not mean, that does not negate this passage that God is no respecter of persons. Because the reason why he loves Jacob and not Esau is not because of something that he sees in Jacob that is lacking in Esau. That's what the whole point is, that the favoritism that God shows to the elect is purely gracious. Not because he notices that one of these people uh, should receive this particular blessing. And I don't think anybody in this room really wants fairness. God forbid them. Don't ever ask God for justice. You might get it. Here you go. After postmodernism, What's the next big intellectual challenge to the Christian faith? Post-postmodernism. <laughs> well, I, uh, uh, I think that, first of all, uh, postmodernism is, someone has said, like intellectual Velcro dragged across the landscape of our culture right now. It just gathers the lint. Whatever it picks up is postmodern. And I think there's a tendency right now to sort of demonize or lionize postmodernism. And I have to always ask people when it, either they're attacking postmodernism or hailing it, what do you mean? What are you talking about when you're talking about postmodernism? Because some postmodern writers, I think, have a lot to teach us. And I think there is a little, more than a little, modernism. Uh, running in our veins, even in, uh, among uh, conservative evangelicals. That's great. We need to hear that. Uh, modernism certainly did us no favors. And if somebody's talking about being postmodern, we ought to listen. What are you talking about? If it means that rationalism, which smothered claims to supernatural revelation, are over, and now we can examine. Uh, those claims again, that's one thing. If it means that examining anything doesn't matter anymore because there is no truth or ultimate meaning, that's a problem. Uh, so I think that you have to, we have to always ask people, what do they mean? For instance, Paul Ricoeur is a, is, uh, was a, a very important postmodern philosopher. He was also a uh, sort of Bardian uh, uh, French Reformed uh, layman who attended church all of his life. And 
has a lot of uh, his thinking anchored in the biblical text. Now, we can disagree with a lot of his, his, uh, his arguments, but I have been challenged by some of the ways he talks about preaching, drawing us out of the narratives of this world into the strange new world of the text of Scripture. Well, he's a postmodern philosopher who has something to teach me. I still think he has problems, but I think a lot of modern philosophers have, have problems. So I think that we have to… I'm really concerned that the culture war is determining how we use these terms instead of what particular arguments are being advanced. And I think uh, Al does a good job of pointing out the differences uh, between relativism, for example, and the critique of modernity. The, there are some fantastic postmodern critiques of modernity that we ought to read and be appreciative of without swallowing uh, the… I, I have to say, I think a lot of my friends, evangelical uh, theologians and, and uh, philosophers, are sometimes just as all-embracing of everything postmodern as their parents are rejecting everything postmodern, and those are both mirrors of each other. I, I, if I can might say, I really appreciate the, the way you approach that, Michael, because, uh, you know, if, if indeed postmodernism begins with the death of the meta-narrative, we need to recognize it had to happen because a whole lot of meta-narratives crashed in the 20th century, and we saw them crash and burn. Marxism, uh, you, you name it, uh, so many of them crashed and burned. When it comes to truth being socially constructed, well, we see that happen all the time. The question is, is all truth socially constructed? There's a prophetic critique there. But, you know, in the academic world, we, we, we get a, a filter down system. First of all, postmodernism emerged in France. It had to be translated into English. It showed up first in architecture and then in the literature departments. Theology got to it late, and by the time most people are talking about postmodernism, the French moved on to something else, and uh, it's, already, it's already moved to a, a different set of challenges. Postmodernism, in retrospect, wasn't postmodern. Uh, it, it, it is a, an artifact of modernity, but it does rec recognize and reflect a, a serious turn. You know, in the academy, as you would well know, the preferred term now is, is late modernity with the larger understanding that postmodernism fits somewhere in this massive turn that is happening right now in late modernity, and we're going to find out where this goes, and that's where you better keep your eyes open, and, uh, and, and we will find out what comes next. They don't send us a postcard from the future to tell us what comes next. Yeah, when you, when you read people like Brian McLaren and the leaders of the emergent movement who, who sort of uh, lionize postmodernism as the great new age, the third age of the spirit. Uh, it's so modern. I mean, for, right? For, it's like right out of Lessing's The Education of the Human Race, uh, an Enlightenment text. It's a passage right out of that. And people like Jacques Derrida, the sort of poster boy of French postmodernism, uh, he readily admitted that it was modern. This is a long conversation. I have a letter from him, in fact, where I was bringing up some of the things on Kant, he says, I, I readily admit that my conversation is with Kant and Hegel. This is a continuing conversation within modernity, and I think a lot of it's romanticism. Modernity has always had this pendulum swinging between rationalism and sentimentalism, and I think that's in part what we're still seeing today. All right. In reference to our justification, is there a reward for the elect according to their works? I haven't heard from you there lately. I fell asleep. That's the last question. <laughs> you fell asleep on the last question. Um, <laughs> this is the only time I got in an argument with Brian Chappell. Um, and it wasn't a bad argument, it was just a discussion. But he was arguing that there were no rewards, and I was arguing that there were rewards. Trouble is, I can't remember why I was arguing that there were rewards, <laughs> and I don't remember his argument against it. So, I'm not going to answer this question. Uh, this, this person cites two passages. I think we could find it. about 25 passages in the New Testament 
that teach us very clearly that our rewards in heaven will be given according to our works. And how does that square with the doctrine of justification by faith alone? Well, Augustine once said that the distribution of, of rewards in heaven according to works is not because there is some kind of inherent merit in the works that we perform that impose an obligation upon God to reward them. Rather, he used the phrase, splendid vices. He said our best works, even after our regeneration, are so tainted by the ongoing sin in our life that they are at best splendid vices, not real virtues that are worthy of reward. Nevertheless, though our works or our relative degree of obedience does not merit for us particular rewards, God has graciously determined to distribute rewards in heaven according to our works. And Augustine again called that God's crowning His own gifts, because any good works that we perform, tainted to whatever degree they are, are also of grace. But the basic point is that we are justified, we are declared just by God and enter into our reconciliation and have peace with Him right now on the, uh, uh, the sole instrument by which we receive the benefits of the work of Christ is by faith. And after we are justified, sanctification begins immediately upon our justification. And that whole lifelong process of sanctification will yield real rewards in heaven. There's no real contradiction there. Yeah, our uh, dear brother Jim Boyce, who died 10 years ago this week. 10 weeks ago on the 15th. Uh, he, 10 years ago, yeah. He spoke of this in a way I'll never forget because he rightly said, any of us looking at, uh, at incommensurate houses today, for instance, or incommensurate estates would say, there's something morally dubious about this. I mean, this, this looks like Genesis 3 to us. Somehow the inequality, the, the, the distinction that, that doesn't look right. Well, in heaven, to the contrary, to the glory of God, whatever distinction there is in rewards, as depicted in biblical imagery, is going to actually make every glorified believer see the glory of God even more abundantly. No one's going to say on that side of our glorification, there's something morally dubious about this. Everyone's going to say, yes, that's exactly right, most perfectly to display the glory of God. That's about all we can say, and once it's said, we probably ought to stop. And if I could throw in dangerously after, uh, say that's where we should stop. Um, if, if, uh, if Paul says, who has ever given him anything that he should repay him? God is not repaying us, as, you, as everyone said so far. But when we're holy, when I'm really holy, am I going to begrudge Corey Ten Boom's celebration, coronation? I don't think so. I think when I'm really holy, part of the party <laughs> is going to be watching that woman receive more crowns than I receive. Good. Yes. You, yeah. Did we wake you up? Yeah, I just came around. I, <laughs> have we have disturbed you from so your just, dogmatic I'm, I'm slumber? Ba I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. All right. Um, no, Welcome I'm, back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, no, I, if you go to the Cleveland Symphony, and uh, you've got a pretty poor seat 55 rows back, then just to concur with what Al's saying, you know, you say, I'm going to have to try harder next time, or I'm going to get in touch with somebody. Um, but uh, finally, in our glorified condition in heaven, even if I am in row 86 underneath the balcony, it will seem perfectly right. And especially, I'll even be able to rejoice that Al is sitting right up in the dress circle, you know. <laughs> And because that would certainly be a whole lot better than having to be at a Cleveland Browns football game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no analogy there. But really all. close, but really close to a recent Lakers victory. <laughs> R.C. Yes. Can I just read a verse? Of course. Oh, of course. Let's hear a verse. 
Well, I think just the simplicity of this verse answers it. Uh, Revelation 22, 12, and it's mentioned there's 25 of these verses, but the text speaks very clearly to this. Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I mean, it's hard to put another spin on that ball. That's right. Um, there will be rewards, and Christ is bringing them with him. We are saved by grace, but we are judged by works. And there will be a judgment, and we will, as a steward before his master, give an account for what has been entrusted to us, and greater faithfulness will merit greater, or wrong word, but will bring about greater reward, and well done, thou good and faithful servant, you will be over ten cities. And the next one is given over five cities. And so there is some distinction there. And I think also when we see that the saints are casting their crowns back before the Lord, it is emblematic that this crown doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the Lord. I mean, He chose me. He predestined me. He redeemed me. He called me. He regenerated me. He indwelt me. He sanctified me. He preserved me. He has now glorified me. He empowered me. And Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. And all good that is accomplished in and through our lives is solely of grace. And so I think even in that moment, as we would hold a crown or whatever it would be like, we would realize, I, I can't put this on my head. I mean, this isn't mine. I mean, it's all of grace that I'm even here. It's all of grace that has enabled me to serve Him faithfully. And a casting back to the Lord, it's like Romans 11:36, that from Him and through Him and now to Him are all things. And just even this worship in heaven of casting our crowns back at His feet, but you're going to want to have more crowns than fewer crowns to cast at His feet in an act of eternal worship to God. And so, uh, I think that the text speaks very clearly that there will be reward, and it will be on the basis of what we have done. Thank you for Steve. Uh, our time is up for this Q&A. Uh, before I ask you to thank uh, the men on the panel, let me tell you that we weren't able to get to all the questions that we've collected, but we have a new process at Ligonier. Whatever questions are submitted at our conferences that we don't have time to answer here at the conference, we give them to John Duncan who is the producer of Renewing Your Mind, and we have uh, from time to time Q&A times on the radio, and we'll try to get to these questions at some time on Renewing Your Mind. So I can give these to you, Chris, right? In the meantime, let's thank these people for being with us. On the